Hey, Donna, I want you to speak to just some of the challenges you've um, you've faced as a as a as a young worship leader and and uh, really the question I had for you was what are some of the challenges that you faced as a woman? But these may not even be specific to gender here. I mean, just just walk me through as you as you you know have started to really launch into ministry and and all the stuff that comes with that. Um, talk to me about some of the struggles, some of the challenges, and if there were some that were specific to, to, to being a woman, I want, I'd want to hear about that. Yeah. Um, I would say the primary one, um, this is mostly being young, probably less being a woman, but um, I think just growing up, and any one of us, because of giftedness, have been celebrated since probably a young age for that giftedness in the world is very affirming of musical gifts. um, And it sometimes forgets to then go, okay, then let me build you up in these other ways. And so I would say that I came into my 20s um, very secure in the fact that I was musically gifted, but not secure in my real identity, which was as a daughter of Christ. And, um, And so I was looking for all of my worth in that place. And so I started the residency at Watermark in, I want to say 2016. Um, And my boss at the time, John Abel, who leads there said, Hey, I really want you to do this because I know that you're gifted, but I think you need a foundation. Um, And I don't want to put you on a stage for your giftedness without knowing first that you're rooted in what's important and in what matters. And so that year was very transformative for me in both recognizing oh my gosh, my identity has been in the wrong place for a really long time. Um, And then also in changing where I was putting that. Um, But it can be really tough. Um, I think just for for all young worship leaders, there's a tendency to have a great deal of giftedness and maybe an imbalance with spiritual maturity. Um, And so I feel like I'm I'm trying to catch up now a little bit to, to other people who are older and wiser. And I'm trying to follow people who have been in down this path before, uh, but that can be tough. And then um, I would say the other one, this is more from the female perspective is I can get paralyzed by fear that I'm going to be disobedient to God's word in the way that I lead. Um, And that's coming. I'm coming from a complementarian background. There are healthy parts of that. There are unhealthy parts of that. And I think the fear is the unhealthy part. Um, but the concern for being obedient to God's word is the healthy part. And I think when I went through that residency program, I did a lot of, uh, hard work to study and understand what God's word says about what I ought to do as a woman in the church. Uh, I read the village's, uh, paper on it, which was super helpful. Shout out to the village. Um, and I, and I just, it took a while to come into my own. I was afraid to speak. Uh, in front of the body, because I was like, well, what if I'm, you know, exercising authority over whatever, you know, all these, all these passages are like looming over my head. And I'm going, is it okay? Is it okay? Um, And it took, it took me a year uh, of studying to finally be comfortable with how God had asked me to lead. Mm -hmm. Uh, But now I really am, but it does take time. And I think we have to try, the balance is tough between obedience and also walking in freedom in the way that he would call us to use our gifts. So good. Dinah, the, the village has an, like an 80 page version and a six page version. Which version did you read? I've read both. Uh, <laughs> I took out a blue highlighter and I read the 80 page version yes. in a binder. I still yes. have it. It's really helpful. Yes. You know, we, we laugh about it, but just having some resources like that that are so great. There's a round table with Jen Wilkin and Josh and, and Matt that is really, really helpful. And most of what's helpful in that video is hearing Jen uh, give perspective on that. So it, it's cool that you mentioned that. It really is a great resource. Of course, uh, you know, we're, when we're dealing with leaders, we're thinking about their local context. So they're under the authority of their pastors. And so that, that's, that's a huge point of emphasis here. But I think as you're digging into these things to, to balance exactly what you said, because it can feel like a tug of war of sorts. Uh, and I think that's especially true for, for women, at least from what you're saying. And so mm-hmm. I appreciate you mentioning that. 
Um, Jalisa, would love to ask you and then really open this up to, to any of you guys. Are there some other fears in terms of leading that you have had to overcome? And I say that as somebody who leads. And I mean, you know, we, I, I still have kind of daily fears and maybe more insecurities, I would probably say. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just curious, like, you know, if you might share some of that and then maybe some ways that um, you've asked God to take that from you. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely resonate with the feeling of being a young leader and wondering if people are going to take me seriously when I get on a stage. Um, not everyone in the room that I'm leading all the time is also in the early 30s. And so sometimes when I'm leading a room of people who are a little bit older, I'm like, do they care what I'm saying? Do they think, do they believe what I'm saying? Does it make sense to them? Um, I think I'm, I'm also single. And so I've wondered if that kind of like a single woman leading feels irrelevant to women who have families um, or people who have families. I've wrestled through that and had many conversations with people about that. Um, So those are things, those two things are kind of the first two that come to my mind as things that I've asked the Lord to remove and also just shed appropriate perspective onto. And I think the thing that I constantly just keep coming back to is like, person after person in scripture, story after story, it's God who appoints and anoints. And so um, even if there are people who are like, I don't want to submit to this girl's leadership, that's okay. (laughs) I'm there because the Lord put me um, in that place. And he is where authority comes from, right? It's not the stage. It's not gender. It's not life stage. Um, Authority is coming from the spirit and from the appointment of the Lord. And so um, even in weeks or at events where those kinds of old lies kind of creep in and kind of make me feel like, okay, this isn't going to work because you're, you're young, you're single, whichever. Um, the Lord, I've had to ask him just to remind me like, Hey, just remind me where my authority comes from and where my identity is. And like, it's not about my wisdom. That's not what I'm speaking from up here. I'm pointing people to you and you were to be trusted. Even if people don't trust me for whatever reason, um, I just have had to ask the Lord to constantly bring me back uh, to that truth and trust in him. Yeah. Donna Lauren, anything you would add to that just in terms of, you know, fears or insecurities as you lead? I'm never insecure before I leave. I mean, <laughs> I'm a but I'm just, uh, gosh, that has been that has been a huge battle from the beginning uh, of leading worship. And but I, I will say, um, I've found a lot of victory in the last few years, in particular. And I'm like I said, 40, so it's taken me a while. But um, I think some fears that I have are that. Um, Honestly, that I wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be good enough um, that um, wouldn't be good enough that I would be a distraction, um, that I would struggle with performing instead of like actually leading. And so um, those have definitely been places and Donna knows, Donna knows (laughs) these things about me where I've struggled uh, for a really long time. And I think uh, what I falsely believed that I would come to a point where I felt so good about how I was le- leading, how I was singing, how I was sounding, that um, I wouldn't ever struggle again. Like I'd be nailing it all the time that you could just rip my raw vocal out of the, you know, out of the recording, put it on your, you know, an MP3 and just play it. And it sounds wonderful. Um, I just had this, this belief that I would just get to this day that it would be perfect. And I, then I'd know, then I'd know I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. Um, but it hadn't turned out that way. Instead, the Lord did a huge work in my heart through celebrate recovery, um, through just living life and being disappointed and struggling and having a hard time and not doing it well. Um, and then even to, eventually just I remember there was one um, one sermon Matt preached uh, years ago that he was like uh, it was about I think the man at um, the pool of Bethesda where he's like what do you want me to do for you and Matt was like just ask for whatever it is it even if it seems you know um, like trivial and I asked the Lord I want to just enjoy, enjoy my voice I want to enjoy my own voice. And it felt really selfish to ask that. Um, but the Lord slowly let me start to enjoy my own voice. Um, 
And so I knew, yes, I knew that my identity was not in being a good worship leader or um, having a good voice or performing well. I knew all those things, but I needed the Lord to just totally renovate my heart to know, like you said, Jolie said, that it's God who appoints and anoints. And even if I don't feel like I'm doing the best I could do or that I'm the best female vocalist that we have, um, that, that the Lord's put me on that stage in front of those people um, to lead them to uh, an, uh, some kind of connection with the living God. And um, so that that's been something that I'm still growing in, that I still have to, before I step on that stage, remember, Lord, you have put me here. You have appointed me. You have anointed me. I'm here not so that I do a great job or that my vocal's great or that I know exactly what to say in this point to really turn people's hearts to the Lord, um, um, but it's to be obedient and to, to look at those faces um, and know some of those stories of the people that I'm leading and being overwhelmed with gratitude that he lets me be in that spot, that he lets me lead, that he lets me sing songs to him and about him that he enjoys, whether I enjoy how I sounded or not, he enjoyed it. Um, so that it's been a long road, um, but there have been sweet victories. There's been a lot overcome in the middle, in all of it. Mine's been the inverse. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not about that. I think I sound good. That's not it at all. It's what Jaleesa said earlier. What she said about, um, am I too, am I too young to for these people to be paying any attention to me? I, I don't. My my church is very young, and so I have the inverse of that. I have the, am I too old? <laughs> the, no, seriously, and I mean, I. It, it is. It's a, it's an insecurity to go. Okay, am I? Am I done? Am I over? Is what I have to say, does it matter anymore? Is the way that I lead antiquated? Is it, you know, what is this um, thing that I'm dealing with is actually like, okay, when I, when I read the scriptures and I see, actually, if we go back to back in, in Israelite days, you know, there was a, there was a number when you were, you, you hit that number, when you hit 55, you are no longer doing anything in the temple, but you are pouring into the next generation. Mm-hmm. I'm not 55. So let's just say that. I'm not, I'm not, uh, but what I'm trying to say is like, all, I'm finding that something I've had to embrace is that I am not just a worship leader. Uh, I am also a shepherd and shepherds don't sing all the time. Uh, shepherds, you know, they, they do a lot of dirty work and they do a lot of caring for the sheep. And they honestly they do some breaking of legs of sheep and throwing them on right. sheep and throwing them on their shoulders. But like, how do we shepherd? And, and I've had to be more in that vein, especially like when I had kids, my worship leading life slowed way down because we had kids like bang, bang, bang. And then, uh, and they were like, where'd Donna go? Um, but praise God, because it allowed me to see what it really feels like to shepherd in a way that I didn't know because I'd never had kids before. And, and yeah, so that's a gift to be able to be a mom and a worship leader. It is an added gift, but it doesn't take away that I still have a voice and I still have other things that I should be doing. Yeah. I should still be leading worship off stage. And so for me, I've loved this seat. I might cry. I knew it. Dang it. I'm the one. Um, darn it. Lauren, I know you prayed for this. Um, so like I have been just going, okay, God, I have, I have amazing worship leaders at my church that I want to be wind in their sails and I want to speed them up and slow them down, speed them up and slow them down. You know, I want to help them grow. I want to help them uh, do what's best and have a posture of worship and have a lifestyle of worship and have character and all the things that you're talking about. Lisa, I just love it. Um, but I want that for my, my church. I want that for my people. Um, but that might mean that I'm not the one singing. And um, for, for me, that's hard. Because I, I enjoy singing and I enjoy that. But I've had to take a step back. And what I'm finding is as I take that step back, that younger generation is actually saying, hey, actually, we want to hear what you have to say about things. Like, I don't know, maybe Robbie sees like, hey, you want to be on a call for initiative about, you know, worship leaders or whatever? I'm like, oh, me? Sure, yeah. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? So it's just kind of one of those, like, I, I have to battle the has-been lie. Mm. Um, and I have to believe that worship is, is not just singing. And that if I'm going to be a good worship leader, I have to train everyone uh, that they are worshiping this thing because what singing is only part of what we do. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So, so good right there. So listen, we have a few more minutes. I'm not going to keep you all day on this call, but there is a question I want to ask of each of you before we um, read the Psalms together and close. Um, the question is this, what encourages you most about the church? I mean, really, we're specifically asking about Worship, and I know worship is like a loaded term because none of us believe that worship uh, consists only of music or art. I mean, that's so that's kind of a separate podcast, but this should, the assumption is there that when we say worship, but in terms of musical worship and in terms of the arts and the church, what are you encouraged by in the church, the capital C church, not just your own church? And then what would you caution us on? What What is something, an area of concern that you would want to speak to on it? call like this and uh, Jalisa if it's okay could we start with you and then and then the rest of you uh chime in as you as you will yeah oh man so many things to be excited about um I truly think watching especially kind of our sphere of church like thinking about like my kind of sphere um working in a complementarian environment and that sort of thing I get really fired up to see more women writing songs, more women on calls like this, more women um, growing as musicians and also like agreeing with God's call for them to lead as worship leaders and seeing the church um, kind of loosen its grip on maybe what a leader should look like or what a leader should be and giving more space for women to run in their gifting. I get really, really, really excited about it, especially as someone developing other female leaders, I would hate to encourage them to agree with something that they'll never get an opportunity to do. And so I get really excited to see that happening in churches all over so that when I'm developing women, I'm, I can encourage them towards something like God has a place for you to go. Um, and other people will champion and support that. So that gets me really excited. I think an area of caution, oh gosh, is, um, we're in this like funky ministry as celebrity kind of strange culture. And I worry when I talk to other worship leader friends who are kind of looking to the right and to the left and wishing that their church was like other churches, um, that their leaders were like leaders of other churches, that their um, culture or vibe or look or music was just like someone else's. And I, yeah, I, I know all, the Lord is so sovereign over all of that, but I think I, I would just caution people um, to be so content with where God has put them and so faithful um, with what he's put in front of them. Like have fun worshiping Jesus and shepherding people and loving on your people right where you are and let it like catch the Lord's vision for it. Like be excited for the life that he wants to breathe into that space and don't add this pressure onto your ministry. That is not from the Lord. That this voice saying that your ministry should look like someone else's or your church should look like some other church. That's just, if the Lord wanted you in those places, he would have put you in those places. Um, but you are where you are because he has a vision that he wants to make happen through you. And so I would rather us be really eager to catch God's vision for where we are than to kind of absorb what's happening in other places and wish that that was our context. And Lauren, I would ask you the same thing. Just what are you encouraged by and what's an area of caution for us? I'm really encouraged by um, what I see like songwriting wise, just worship songs that uh, there's a little bit, a bigger pool than just a couple of um, churches and organizations offering stuff. Um, but also the mix of uh, kind of spirit and truth that there's a lot of really good truth, but it's not robotic sounding. It's interesting artistically and musically. And so I, I, I'm really excited about that, about church music and in the future, what it is now in the future. And I'm with Jalisa on uh, where I would caution us is not looking to the right or to the left and not comparing ourselves to um, other uh, worship ministries of other churches, but to be content with um, our sound, with our look, 
um, because we're made up, we're localized. And that's the Lord made us localized uh, people, made us limited to um, have boundaries around us. And and so that's going to flavor our music. That's going to flavor our look, the stories of our people, the songs that our people need to sing are going to be flavored differently. And if that ends up affecting um, and resonating with like globally or nationally or whatever, that is great. Um, Also want to caution that um, there is, um, I think there is something that I believe that if a song was good enough, it would eventually find itself out there. Um, And that's a terrible way to measure the, the worth or value of a song because Mm -hmm. there are a lot of places paying really big money to get flat their songs out there. So um, just want to say that it is worth uh, getting your songs uh, in the mouths of your people um, to sing from your your church, and if it if it goes beyond that, great. But that doesn't mean it's a good or a bad song, or it's less valuable if it doesn't go as far. Um, so, yeah, that's great, Dinah. Same question. Um, yeah, I think the thing that I'm really encouraged by especially specifically with worship is everybody that I meet that seems um high profile celebrity whatever pastor worship leader whoever um is shockingly humble and Mm -hmm. self-aware and willing to be vulnerable and I've seen a lot of people who have uh, a pretty big platform not get in their heads about their platform and I'm sure, I'm sure that's a wrestling match that they're doing with the Lord all the time. Like probably all four of us, all five of us would say that we are doing. Um, but it's really sweet to me to see that nobody thinks they're too cool for school, um, but they all know that they're sinful and broken um, and needy. And that's why they do what they do. And I, I'm kind of surprised. I think I, I can make really negative assumptions about my brothers and sisters who are in the spotlight and then you get to know him and it's like, man, you just love Jesus like everybody else. Like this, it's really sweet to see. Um, and so it, it makes me excited about what could happen in the world of worship ministry um, when people aren't about themselves, but are about the Lord. Um, and then the caution, I think um, twofold one, that's a fragile thing that we have um, that could die easily if we stop fighting our flesh. And so I would caution Never stop getting on your knees and asking the Lord to keep you humble. Um, But then also, I think something I've been passionate about in recent years is just it's worth the sacrifice of not always getting to play the coolest and most popular and interesting songs if they're going to be confusing to the body. Um, And that's been a hard like we so I worked at Watermark for several years. I now am working somewhere else and because I followed my husband to the church that he's working at. But um we had that conversation all the time of like, man, this song sounds so good and I want to play it so bad, but Mm. I just can't reconcile this lyric. And if I can't make sense of this for somebody, then is it worth leading them in a direction that's not going to help them connect with the Lord, but it's going to make them go, what does that mean? Um, And so I would say uh, even to, to Lauren's point, write songs full of good truth if you don't think you can find one where you would normally go. Um, It is worth teaching people well, even if it means you're not being the coolest or the most mainstream. And Dinah, I love love the way that you put that because it's not always that songs are heretical. Some some are, actually. (laughs) But (laughs) but sometimes 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 it's just a lyric. It can be confusing. And I think of the songs that I've written through the years, I didn't have heresy in mind. There's a few songs that I go, that lyric might just be confusing. And we don't always have the chance to unpack that on a Sunday gathering. I might in a concert, you know, mm-hmm. so there's several songs that I might have the chance to, hey, let me, let me just walk you through this song. It's what it means. But because what you said is, hey, it, it might just be confusing and you might not have the chance to clarify and uh, I think that's, that's a major point because sometimes we can think in truth and heresy. And of course, we should think in those, those terms. But there's a lot of gray there that we go, man, that song just might not make sense for our people because we can't unpack that. So mm-hmm. I, I appreciate the way that you, you said that. Donna, uh, lastly, um, same question. Yeah, wow. It's, um, it's 
hard to be the last one because everybody has such great answers and I feel like they all got taken and they're all well said. So that was well done. Uh, and I also can't promise that this door won't blast open with three children running through in a minute. So but that's... <laughs> <laughs> we're almost done we're almost done That's great uh so you know this is kind of on the topic of you know the the actual worship happening like songs and worship and all that i feel like something that um because of where we are with our nation and our world right now with COVID 19 um i think something that is going to be a huge temptation is for people to not go back to church and not sing together in the same room alongside each other uh, and they will forsake the assembly. And, it, and, it, and I do believe that that is what it means. I mean, that yes, they'll be online together, but it's not together. It's, it's, it's apart from each other. And it's, I think we're in a um, season where it's isolated and isolation almost always leads to temptation. And so I feel like um, one of the things that I am uh, excited about right now is that thousands and thousands of people are going to church, you know, because they're watching church. Um, and that's good. And God can snatch their hearts and God can make them his. And this is a huge, amazing, like awakening time. And so I'm encouraged by that. I am worried and I want to not be worried, but I want to say when it's time to worship again as churches and as bodies of believers and as flocks, we got to do it. And that means that we've got to really make sure that our people know, hey, we're singing online together right now, but it sure does sound a whole lot better in a room full of people who are all living life together and doing life alongside each other and singing with their own vocal cords next to someone singing with their vocal cords. You know, so, um, yeah, that doesn't really answer your question. It's just something that I'm a little worried about um, because there is going to be a major temptation to be able to stay in your pajamas forever on Sundays, and um, which that's fine. Just go to church in your pajamas uh, on Sundays and see how that feels. Um, but I, I think... I think we just, I'm looking forward to the day I get to, I am going to cry. I look forward to the day I get to worship with my people again. Yeah, yeah. Don't like doing this online. I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. I wish that you and I were all in the same room together and we were talking about this mess. I understand technology is great, but I just think that we are worship leaders of people, of multiple people all together. And so we got we to gotta shoot for that. And I'm, I'm ready. I don't know about you guys, but I'm ready, I'm ready for that to be. God, God help us. Hey, mm -hmm. we're, we're going to wrap up. Uh, Lauren, I would love for you to quickly just speak about the Psalms because every time I do a call with, with leaders like you, I want to make sure that we end with a, just a few minutes in the Psalms. But I'd love for you to s specifically give some insight to just how the Psalms are personal to you, not necessarily how we're going to use them in a, a gathering or whatever, but just as part of your, your personal worship, what have the Psalms meant to you? Yeah, um, well, Psalm 107 has been a psalm that the Lord just put before me, where it's uh, Israel facing four different kinds of distresses and the desert, chains, folly, and the storm. And so there's just nothing in that psalm that I can't identify with. There, every season that I could possibly go through. And the refrain is, um, thank the Lord for his steadfast love to the children of man. Um, and so I think... I think the Psalms, so that one, um, I would say Psalm 13 and 42, they're the howling songs, the songs of David where he says, how long, O Lord, how long? Um, I, you know, those are, they've put words in my mouth to uh, emotions that I've felt, um, the whole gamut of it. And then um, uh, Psalm 3, which uh, Robbie wrote a song on Psalm 3. And we probably had the hardest season of our lives. Um, like we've been through brain cancer. We have been through miscarriage. We've been through a lot. And probably um, about two years ago was the beginning of 18 months that were really, really hard for Matt and me um, in ministry and in our church. And um, there was a lot of, of um, just things that were coming against us on all sides. And Psalm 3 um, was just something that I, I prayed and I even played that song over and over that you, Lord, are shield about me. Um, I needed 
to remember that he would be the shield about me because right now I feel like I am on everyone's like bullseye. I feel like Matt, the church. And so Lord, I need you to be that shield. So personally, the Psalms, they, like I said, they give, they give me words, but words in my mouth, um, to the emotions that I'm feeling, every distress, every joy, um, you can find something um, in the Psalms to, to be able to just pray and um, meditate on um, when, when you're just struggling to find the words. I think it was Calvin who said that when we look at the Psalms, they're like a mirror and they reflect back all of our humanity. So like when I look in the mirror, I see some things I like and a bunch of stuff I don't like. And the Psalms do that for us. I mean, all of our humanity, and of course, if it was just our humanity, that, that's not sufficient, right? But when we look to the Psalms, we also see a, a deep trust in God's sovereignty. And the Psalms lead us to that trust, even when it's really, really hard. And Psalm 3 is one of those Psalms for sure. And thank you for sharing that. Hey, um, Dinah, we're going to close. I would love for you. Would you mind just um, reading from the Psalms? Um, uh, and then Jalisa, once she's done, would you just pray over... Not just our time, um, and this has been awesome, and I know y'all have to get off this call, but this has been so fun, but not just over us, but really over leaders that are going to be watching. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's going to be uh, both men and women that will view this, and I want you just to pray over their ministries as well. So Dinah and then Jalisa. Uh, this is Psalm 8. Uh, o Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you've established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? And yet you've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh man, God, that's the perfect psalm um, to be reading today after a conversation like this. Just the fact that you, you know us, um, you hemmed us, you created us, and you know our frame, and yet you, as holy as you are, as gracious and perfect and majestic as you are, you are mindful of us. Um, you're mindful of um, the places that we're in, the churches that we lead, the ministries we're a part of. You um, are so mindful of um, the flock that we shepherd and live life among. God, I just want to say thank you for that, that um, not a single piece of our lives escapes your sight or your intentionality and care and kindness. Um, God, I want to thank you for the wisdom represented um, in this time. It's you. It's your voice. It's the only reason we have things to share today and experiences to draw from is because you have invited us to be a part of something unbelievable, um, which is exalting um, your name and your goodness. And so we want to say thank you for that and for your um, perfect wisdom that allows us to have conversations like this. God, I want to pray um, for all of our friends who are listening to this today. God, I pray that you would be near to them. Um, I pray that um, in the season that we're in currently, as they're looking ahead to the future, um, God, that you would breathe um, endurance and life and vision um, to them and um, their their leadership and the people that they're caring for. Um, God, would you just show us the way? We're all asking for that. Um, God, I pray that um, we would never cease to be a praying people, that we would never cease to be a people who um, confess, who are deeply known by the people around us. Um, God, your word says that there's uh, your perfect strength represented in our human weakness. And so um, I pray for us and for anyone listening and watching right now, God, just that we would um, lean into the places where we maybe are a little bit weaker so that you can prove strong and prove faithful um, and that we would constantly come back to you and depend upon you and find um, that our identity and our best days, um, God, are rooted in you and in your um, kindness and in your mindfulness of us. Um, Jesus, we love you. 
um, we're grateful for your life, for your death, for your resurrection that's um, given us the opportunity um, to call God Father um, and to get to lead in the places that we get to lead. It's not in our power. Um, Jesus, it's in yours um, and by the Spirit. So um, we ask that you come, that you continue to move among us, support us, teach us, lead us. Um, we're dependent on you. We look to you. We love you and pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, y'all, I've had the, the joy of serving with you on a stage at some season in my life, which dawned on me as we were starting this call. And I respect you as musicians and leaders on a stage, but especially as sisters in Christ off of a stage. And so this has meant so much to me that you would take time to join us. So thank y'all. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Oh.